This morning, I want us to look at the book of Philemon. So you can go ahead and start trying to find that in your Bible. It's in the New Testament. Uh, if you have, a, have the Bible on your phone, it's probably going to be a little easier to find. But this is a good follow-up to the series that uh, we've been doing for many weeks. We looked at the book of Colossians for quite a few weeks. And in the book of Colossians, we found that Paul is writing to a church while he's in prison. And the church that he's writing to, he's never actually been to this church. He didn't start the church. But he writes to them to encourage them and to show them that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the supreme creator. He reveals God to the world. He also writes in his letter to help us understand that we reveal Christ to the world in the way that we live, in our actions, our attitudes, our words, our behaviors. Everything that we do should represent the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? Okay, you guys are not awake. I said, right? Amen. All right. Now, at the end of this letter in, in Colossians, Paul is writing, and it's normal for Paul to do this. He, he gives greetings. So-and-so sends greetings to you because they're, they're together. They're doing ministry together. Well, Paul's in prison, but there are other people who are there to help him because he can't get out and do ministry. So people were helping Paul with his ministry. Let's look at Colossians 4.7. And you know, when someone was in our Bible study on Wednesday night and we read the Bible on Wednesday night and go through and ask questions and comment, and uh, there's a lot of names that were in our readings, and someone said, I don't know how to say these names. I said, you know what? We just make it up. We don't know how to say all these names. I'm a pastor. I don't know how to say all these names. I just make it all up. Okay, so let's look at Colossians 4, 7. Tychicus will tell you the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. So this man was someone who spent time with Paul in his ministry. He was at different places. He went on missionary journeys with Paul and assisted him in a lot of ways. We all need somebody to help us. And he was going to take the letter that Paul wrote for the Colossians and deliver it to the church. But look at uh, a couple verses down. Because he didn't travel alone. People traveled together in groups. It was a dangerous world. It still is a dangerous world. Verse 9. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. So Paul, Paul sends this letter to the Colossians through Tychicus, but also he's traveling with another man named Onesimus. And some of you might be thinking, Onesimus, Onesimus, that sounds familiar. Where have I heard that name before? You heard that name if you read the book of Philemon. Because Philemon was another letter that Paul wrote at the same time that he wrote Colossians while he was in prison. So they were delivering a letter to the Colossian church. They were also delivering a personal letter to a man named Philemon. This is a personal one-on-one -on -one letter that Paul writes to a, one individual. All, some of the letters that we have are letters that Paul wrote to whole churches. Some letters we have are letters that Paul wrote to individuals like Timothy or Titus or Philemon. So we know from reading the end of Colossians that Paul sent at least three letters out. One to the church in Colossae, one to the church in Laodicea, and one to this man named Philemon. We don't know what happened to the letter to the Laodiceans. We don't have that one. But we have the letter to the Colossians. And we have the letter to Philemon. So what we're going to do today is look at this letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. And our theme that we're going to be looking at is called reconciliation. Reconciliation is a powerful word. It talks about when there's a relationship that is broken, but then the relationship gets put back together. That's reconciliation. It's when, when a relationship is restored. 
And Philemon had a problem that uh, he had a broken relationship with Onesimus. And Paul is writing this letter to help restore their relationship together. And we'll understand it as we go through it and look at it. So Philemon, uh, who is this guy? He's a member of the, ch- of the Colossian church. He's one of the church members there who lives in Colossae. But he was also probably a pretty wealthy man. And he was a friend of Paul's. And from reading the letter, it sounds like it's possible that Paul was the one responsible for helping Philemon to become saved. And so uh, this man it has a close relationship with Paul, Philemon does. And so it's, it's kind of interesting And in, when you think about, here we are reading a letter that was written to a person from Paul. It's a personal thing. And 2,000 years later, now we're reading his letter. You say, well, why are we reading somebody's personal letter? Because of the content. It's so important. Because I want you to understand what the relationship was between Philemon and Onesimus. They weren't brothers. They weren't just friends. In fact, they probably weren't friends at all. Because Onesimus was a slave that belonged to Philemon. Slavery was very common in the Roman Empire. I read one time that it's estimated that a third of the population of the Roman Empire was enslaved. <clears throat> it sounds horrible, and, and it probably was horrible. Many of those slaves were more like employees, but there was, there was definitely some slavery going on that was uh, a bad situation. And here we are looking at uh, a letter that's written about a man and his slave. Why is Paul writing this letter? Well, Onesimus did something bad. He ran away. He stole something from his master and he ran away. A lot of slaves would run away to Rome. It's a big city. You can get lost in the city. Uh, You can uh, try to live and, and lose contact with your master. And so somehow or another, Onesimus managed to steal something from his master Philemon and he ran away and ended up in Rome. But the funny thing is, You can run away from your problems, but you can never run away from God. God's always going to find you. He's always going to catch up with you. And he's always going to lead you back to where you're supposed to be. So here is is Onesimus running away from a problem, going to Rome, and somebody in Rome recognized him. Don't you hate that? Have you ever noticed that we live in a big city, Birmingham, Over a million people in the area of Birmingham. And yet you can go walk around Birmingham and run into people you know. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? How how often you run into somebody you know in a big city. Somebody recognized Onesimus. I can see him grabbing him by the ear. You're going to see Paul. (laughs) And they took him over to see Paul. Because Paul knew him. Or at least he knew about him. Because he knew Philemon. He was his friend. He was someone he won to Jesus. And so Paul was able to talk to Onesimus about Jesus, share with him about the kingdom, and he led him to the Lord. And so now Paul talked Onesimus into going back to Philemon. He was asking him to do something really radical because this is the Roman Empire. A runaway slave could be punished by his master any way the master decided to punish them, including death. And so if Onesimus returned back to Philemon, he he had a risk of expecting to be punished. But Paul convinced him, if I write a letter and address it to your master, I'm telling you he's going to treat you right because he's going to be accountable to me. And so he talked him into doing it. So that's why Paul wrote this letter and and why we're going to look at it today. What I want us to focus on is not so much the idea of slavery 
and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I want us to focus on the idea of restoring relationships. Because many of us have relationships that have been broken in our lives. Maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe it's somebody that you work with or used to work with. Or maybe a neighbor. Maybe someone that you thought was your best friend. And something happened and broke that relationship. <clears throat> but this morning, what I want us to do is to see that there is a possibility for forgiveness and for God to bring relationships back together again. If God can do it for a slave who ran away from his master, he can do it for us. Amen? All right, so let's start with the book of Philemon. We're going to start with verse Four. There's only one chapter just because it's a short little personal letter. So verse 4. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Whenever Paul thought about Philemon, when he was praying for him, he became thankful. Have you ever done that? You're praying for somebody and all of a sudden you just feel this sense of gratitude and thankfulness. I, I feel that all the time when I'm praying for my wife or my kids, my family. I, I think, Lord, I'm so thankful for my family that you gave me. And I'm, and I'm thankful for you guys. I, was, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've said to the Lord, I don't deserve to be here, but I'm so glad to be a part of this church and thankful for every person who is here. I'm so grateful, Lord. You're so good. We need to remember to be thankful as we pray to God and think about how he's blessed us. But then I want you to notice something. He says, because of what? Your love and your faith. Now, normally, when Paul wrote about faith and love, he used the word faith and then love. Look at all of his letters. Go back and read his letters. He would say something about your faith and your love. But in Philemon, he changed it. He said, your love and your faith. Now, that might not seem important. But when someone has a pattern of doing something in a regular way, and they change their pattern, it's probably for a reason. And I think the reason that Paul changed it here was because he wanted to emphasize love. He wanted Philemon to understand, you are a man who's known because you love other people. Keep that in mind, Philemon. You love other people. You demonstrate love. You know what it means to be a person of love. And so that's going to come into play later on. What are you known for? Are you known for your love? Are you known for your faith? What kind of reputation do you have in your workplace? What kind of reputation do you have in your family? at school, in your neighborhood. When people think about your name, what kind of things do they think? Your reputation is important. Your name is important. Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. It's better to have a good name and a good reputation than to have anything else of material wealth in this world. Because if you, if you break your reputation and your trust and your good name, it is so hard to restore. So hard to restore. Think about the name, uh, okay, Americans will get this, Benedict Arnold. Good name or bad name? Bad name. Why? Because he betrayed his country. So we think of him as a traitor. And so anytime you use the word Benedict Arnold, you think of a traitor, someone who betrayed somebody. If I say the name uh, Albert Einstein, what do you think of? A smart guy. A guy who had a big brain, right? A guy who was really intelligent. So your, your reputation is important. What do people think of when they hear your name? 
Do they think of something good or do they think of something bad? We need to have a name that brings honor to God and also uh, helps us to, to live in a positive light. You, you will have so much trouble leading other people to Jesus if you don't have a good name. I'm telling you the truth. Because people will look at your reputation and your, the way you live and what you're known for. And if you try to talk to them about Jesus, but you have a bad reputation, now you're, you're not doing a good job of representing Jesus because you're making Jesus look bad. People say, what? That's what Christians do? Don't want to be one of them. We need to have a good name. Philemon had a good name, a man of love and faith. Verse 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. You feel like maybe uh, Paul is buttering up Philemon. Oh, man, you're such a great guy. You have love. You have faith. You encourage other people. You refresh people. Yeah, Paul's not dumb. He's smart. He, he says, you refresh the hearts of other people. You know what it means to refresh others? It means that you give them encouragement and strength to go another mile. Imagine you're at work, hard work. It's hot outside, and you're sweating, and you're working hard, and your boss comes over to you with a big, tall glass of lemonade. And he says, hey, man, let's take a break for a few minutes. And you sit down in the shade and you drink your cold lemonade and you start to cool down. What happens to your body? It recharges. You get new energy. Now you say, okay, I can finish this job because I've been refreshed. I'm ready to go on. Jan and I were at the mall yesterday and, you know, they have all those little shops in the middle of the floor. And one of them was a bunch of chairs that you sit down, little massage chairs, like that. And they had a whole bunch of those chairs and it had a little sign that says, be refreshed and recharged. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> for a price, but oh, yeah. <laughs> See, be refreshed and recharged. Are you the kind of person that recharges others or are you the kind of person who drains other people? Philemon was the kind of person who recharged people's batteries. You ever look down at your phone and it's like 10%? My battery's almost gone. I got to find some place to plug in. I've had people come to me in my office, Pastor, do you have a plug for my phone? <laughs> my battery's about dead. <laughs> I go open his drawer. Let's see, is it this one, this one, this one, this one? <laughs> Sometimes our life can be like that. Our battery's going down. We're draining, and we need somebody to come in and recharge us, pump us back up, put us back to full again. Be the kind of person that recharges others, puts them back to full. All right, verse 8 and 9. Oh, so yeah, Paul's building him up to ask him a question. So now, time for the question. Therefore, since you're a man of faith, since you're a man of love, since you're an encourager and you refresh other people, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of what? Love. It is none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Remember, Paul is his spiritual father. So Philemon is like a son to him. It's a spiritual son. And he could say, you know what? I'm an apostle. I could order you to do the right thing. But I'm not going to do that because I know you're a man who responds to love. We have a relationship. We respect each other. 
And so I'm not ordering you to do what I'm about to ask, but I'm asking you from one man of God to another man of God. Would you, because you have love and faith, would you do what's right? And though, so now verse 10 is the big question. That I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. So Philemon is Paul's spiritual son, but now Onesimus is Paul's spiritual son. He said, this man came to me and he needed Jesus. And I showed him Jesus. And he's become my spiritual son. That's a powerful word. For Paul to say that about somebody, it means that he brought him into the kingdom of God. And so he tells Philemon, I'm sending you Onesimus back to you, but I'm appealing for him. In other words, I'm speaking on his behalf. Me, Paul, I'm speaking for Onesimus. Onesimus? You mean the man who's a thief? You mean the man who's a runaway slave? Paul said, I'm speaking up on behalf of Onesimus because I believe in him. He became my son. And now I'm asking you to do what's right. Verse 11. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. You know, this is kind of a funny thing right here. In order for this to make sense, you have to understand what the name Onesimus means in its original language. The name Onesimus means useful. But the man stole something and ran away. He didn't live up to his name at all, did he? He wasn't useful. He was useless. He was a man who was not helpful. He was a man who was a thief and a runaway. So Paul says, he used to be useless. I know his name means useful, but he was not. He was not useful. In the past, he was useless. But he says, now he has become Onesimus. He has become useful. He's living up to his name now. He's being authentic and genuine. He's being true to his name. Do you remember the story of Abraham? Originally, his name was Abram. You know what Abram means? Abram means exalted father. How many children did he have? Zero. Can you imagine going through life knowing that your name means exalted father and you don't have any children? And then God came along and said, I'm changing your name. And he's probably like, thank goodness, because this is terrible. Having a name called exalted father and I don't have kids. God said, I'm changing your name from Abram to Abraham. And he said, what? Because Abraham means father of many. And he's like, have you lost your mind? I've got zero kids. And you changed my name from exalted father to father of many. Simon came along and Jesus looked at him and said, Simon, I'm going to change your name. I'm not going to call you Simon anymore. I'm going to call you Peter. What does Peter mean? What does Peter mean? It means a rock. A rock. Peter, you're a rock. <laughs> it means stable. It means a foundation. It means strong. Peter wasn't a rock. He was nothing like that. But Jesus changed his name. Abraham was not a father, but God be- made him a father. Peter was not a rock, but Jesus made him a rock. You understand that they, their names were changed to reflect not who they used to be, but who they could become. Who they could become. Jesus, or Paul said, he's, he used to be called Onesimus, and he wasn't really, but now he is because his potential has arrived. What has God called you? 
What has God called you to be? God wants you to live up to your name, to your potential, to what he's called you to be and to do. Has God called you to be an encourager like Barnabas? Has God called you to be a teacher? Has he called you to be a giver? Has he called you to be a soul winner? What is God calling you to do? I'm challenging you this morning. Live up to your name. Live up to the name that Jesus has given to you. He's called all of us to something important in the kingdom. Everybody. No excuses. And I want you to know that with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can live up to whatever God has called you to be and whatever he's called you to do. Nothing is impossible with God. If a childless man at the age of 100 could become father of many, (laughs) if a man who lost his temper and was, was nothing like a leader, could become the rock of the church. I'm telling you, God can transform your life. He did that for me. I am not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I do not like being around lots of people. And God called me to be a pastor. And I said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> I feel like Abraham. I said, what? But by the grace of God, he has held me together and will continue to hold me together. I don't do what I do out of my energy or out of my strength or out of my talent. I do it out of his. He empowers me. He refreshes me. He equips me to do what I felt like I couldn't do. God does that for us. All right, let's move along because we got to finish this. Now, Paul's really trusting Philemon to do the right thing. Look at verse 12. He says, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. You see, Philemon could be driven to anger and revenge You stole from me. You ran away. You hurt my business. You hurt me personally. You betrayed me. But Paul says, think about this, Philemon. Onesimus is my very heart. You touch this man, you touch my heart. Oh. You see how he's setting this up? He's saying to Philemon, this man is important to me. And the way you treat him reflects what you think about me. I want you to respect him. I want you to treat him right. Verse 13, he said, I I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. Paul said, it crossed my mind. Maybe you could... Onesimus could stay here and he could be serving me in your place because Philemon I know you have a business I know you can't be here but he can be here in your place but then verse 14 he said but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary he said I am a man who respects and honors you as a person I'm I'm not going to take advantage of my position as an apostle in the kingdom and force you to do something you did not want to do. He said, it's your choice. You want to send him back to be here to help me? Fine. I would welcome it because this is a man that can be useful to me. But here's what it comes down to. Verse 15 and 16, this is important. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So now this is like, this is the central 
important part of this letter. Paul says, maybe God has a bigger plan than you and I understand. Yes, he ran away. Yes, he stole from you. Yes, he betrayed you. But God took what this man did wrong and he was able to transform it into something good. And because of what he did, now God has opened the door for him to be saved and to be changed. Your past does not have to dictate your future. Your past does not have to chain you down to what you can expect for tomorrow. Because God can break the chains of yesterday. God can break the chains of the past. God could transform your life and make you a new creature. He can take away old habits. He can take away old sins. And he can make you into a brand new person. Paul says to Philemon, he's, he's returned into you, not as your slave, but as a fellow brother in the kingdom of God. Paul could not change the Roman Empire when it came to slavery. Is slavery wrong? Of course it's wrong. So why didn't Paul write letters about changing slavery? Why did he write letters and say, slaves obey your masters and masters treat your slaves well? Paul couldn't change the whole Roman Empire but he could work on people one at a time. And he's working on Philemon right now. He's saying, Philemon, I want you to change the way you see this man. I, I want you to have a brand new perspective. He's not property, he's a person. He's not just someone who works on your business. He is a fellow believer in Jesus. Change the way you see people, Philemon. Philemon. Not as tools to be used for your own benefit, but as a human being with his own rights. So Paul is trying to transform slavery by transforming the way people see it. If he can change the way Christians view other people, he can transform a whole nation, an empire, a world. It's kind of interesting to think about this. Remember, Philemon belongs to the church in Colossae. So when, when this letter got to Philemon, he read it. It was just for him and his home, his wife and his son or whoever was in his house. That's it. But when he went to church, he heard the other letter that Paul wrote, the letter to the Colossians. Look at what Paul said in that letter. Colossians 3, 10 and 11 and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, here there is no Jew, uh, I'm sorry, no Jew, Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So Philemon has gotten his personal letter. Treat this man with respect. See him as a human being, not as a slave. And then he's sitting in church, and the letter that he wrote to the whole church says, In Christ there is no slave and free, but everybody's free in Jesus. You see, Paul's trying to transform not just Philemon, but a whole community of people to understand the gospel makes an incredible change in the way we see the world, in the way we see other people. We don't come here and stand to worship as doctors, lawyers, plumbers, and cashiers. We don't come here to stand and worship as black and white and brown. We don't come here to worship as men and women. We don't come here to worship as Americans and Asians and Africans and Hispanics. We don't come here to worship as rich people and poor people. We come here to worship as God's people. 
one church, one people of God, serving one creator. Jesus is our peace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Who has broken down every wall that divides people. So Paul says it to Philemon in his personal letter. He says it to the church in the letter that he wrote to the church. All life is precious in God's eyes from the unborn child to the oldest adult in the nursing home. Every life matters. Every life matters. Philemon 8, uh, 1, 18 and 19. And then Paul goes a step further and he says... If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention, you owe me your very self. So this is where we understand the idea that most likely Onesimus stole something from his house and he owes him. But what can he do to pay it back? He's just a slave. It's not like he has a good job where he's got all this extra money and can restore what he's done wrong. How can he make up for having run away? What does he have to offer? But Paul can help. So Paul steps in and he says, Onesimus can't make up for what he did wrong, but I, Paul, am going to take care of it for him. I'll take care of it. You put it on my account. I'll do what I can. Let me ask you a question. Has somebody offended you? Has somebody broken your heart? Hurt your relationship? Maybe this morning it's time to let it go. Maybe this morning it's time for a change. Maybe today is the day you let go of bitterness and hurt and pain and unforgiveness. Because the only thing that bitterness and unforgiveness does is it poisons your own heart. It never punishes the person that you're angry with. It only punishes you. It's time to let it go. It's not worth it. It's like a cancer that eats through your own soul. Did you offend somebody? Did you hurt someone else? Did you betray somebody else? Maybe today is the day to do the right thing. To turn around and and make something that you did wrong, make it right. Maybe today's a day to ask for forgiveness, to tell someone you're sorry, pay the price to restore a relationship. And by the way, if somebody comes to you and they ask for forgiveness, you have to say, yes, I forgive you. Now listen, if it's something that's really bad, you may not ever want to see them again, and you may not ever be friends, but the very... the very least you can do is offer forgiveness and get that out of your soul and out of your conscience and say, I release it. I'm not going to let my anger and hurt and bitterness hold on to me anymore. I release you from that. Now, maybe you'll be friends again and maybe you will never be friends. But at least the forgiveness needs to be offered. You know something? We've all offended God. And yet he offered forgiveness for every one of us. Maybe today you're someone who has offended the Lord. And you're here listening to this message this morning about a guy in prison writing to somebody else who owns slaves. And you say, what does all this have to do with me? Let me tell you what it has to do with you. You're a prisoner to sin. You're a prisoner to an enemy who hates you. And he doesn't want anything good for your life. But Jesus 
wants to set you free. You say, what have I got to pay for the things that I've done wrong against God? I, I'm, an, I'm nothing. I'm like Onesimus. Don't worry about it. Jesus stepped in and he said, put it on my tab. I'll pay for it. I'll take care of it. You can have forgiveness today. And you don't have to pay for it. Jesus already did on the cross. Forgiveness is yours because God loves you so much. Now, we're going to do something this morning before we receive communion together. And this is a, a strong altar call, but it's an important one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, you know what, I was going to ask the band to come up, but instead, is Junior up there? Junior, can you prepare some music, kind of soft? And we're going to play some music, and I'm going to ask you to come to the altar, and we're going to pray. And for those of you who have been watching online, I want to say thank you for watching today and being a part of this service with us. But right now, we're going to do something rather personal. And so we're going to say goodbye to you guys. Thanks for being with us. And please stop back again next Sunday and, and be with us in service again. But right now, I want everyone to stand.